Amen. All right. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm going to be focusing on the first half of this chapter that we read on, um, basically regarding the length of our hair. Now, a lot of people this day will think that, like, God doesn't care what you look like. God doesn't care about your hair. God doesn't care about all this other stuff. He only cares about your heart. And this is, this is just false. Okay, keep your finger if you want to there in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to be coming right back to this. But we're going to be turning to Matthew chapter 23. Because in Matthew 23, we get a little bit of understanding here and, and kind of where people come up with this idea. Now look, the heart is way more important than what's on the outside. No doubt about that. What is on the inside of our heart is, is, is the most important. We need to work on that first. Okay, that is where the priority is. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't care at all about the outside and how the outside looks. He cares about both. The priority goes to the heart and what's on the inside. Yes, absolutely. But he also cares about the outer appearance. Now, we saw here already this first half of the chapter is dealing about the length of our hair. If God didn't care about it, it wouldn't be in the Bible. Okay, and that's, that's the bottom line. But if, look if you would at Matthew chapter 23. I'm going to read from you in verse 25. This was Jesus Christ. He was rebuking the Pharisees. And see, people often call a fundamental Baptist and say, oh, you're Pharisees, you're legalistic, you believe in all these rules and, and all the commandments of God. Well, look, I believe in what the Bible says. The Bible has a lot of commandments in it. And you, just because we're saved by grace, we're not saved through the law, doesn't mean that we just disobey the law and just have nothing to do with it. We still, God still expects us to follow His rules and His laws. Now, look if you, we're in Matthew 23, look at verse 25, Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but, uh, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. People will turn to that in Matthew and say that, oh, see, it doesn't matter what's on the outside, what's on the inside, but that's not what Jesus is rebuking. He's rebuking these Pharisees for being hypocrites. See, what they were, what the Pharisees were, is they liked to make a big show about how holy they were. Oh, look at me. Look at how good I am. They would stand and, you know, give these long prayers. And they liked the uppermost rooms at the feasts and had, be, had an admiration of men. They liked people going up to saying, oh, rabbi, rabbi, you know, and coming to them with their problems. And they were in this position, you know, they were lifted up in their hearts and they would look on the outside see they'd wear the right clothes right they'd they'd look sharp they'd look like they're godly people that they're serving the lord but he says inside they're full of dead men's bones because these guys these pharisees were false prophets they were false teachers they were teaching for the praise of men they were teaching for money for filthy lucre's sake they just wanted to get paid so they would say things that people like to hear and and would just bring more money into the into their into their coffers but what Jesus was rebuking was their hypocrisy. See, if you're going to look like you're doing the work on the outside, you better be doing it. You better be doing it on the inside and serving God with your heart, not just putting on a show. See, it'd be easy for me as a pastor to just kind of put on a show and just kind of blow off my mouth and, and use, oh, amen, and use all the spiritual talk and just, and just give lip service to God's word. But then every other day of the week, just, you know, just live and sin and do everything else. That would be a total hypocrite. That would be, I mean, there's no way that, it, that any of us should be doing that. But definitely not the pastor, definitely not the preacher. Um, you know, we are supposed to have integrity and cleanse first. And that's why he said in verse 26, he says, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that's that which is within the cup and platter. First cleanse your heart. First get your heart right with God. That's where the priority is. That's what we need to focus on first. But notice he doesn't just stop there and say only get the inside clean. He says that the outside of them may be clean 
also. He wants you to get your heart right first. Get the inside clean first. Hey, and then get the outside clean too. Because it's not that that's unimportant. It's just less important. It's just not nearly as important as the heart. But he's not just saying disregard everything on the outside. The way we present ourselves, the way we look, the way we talk, the way, you know, all the aspects of our life are important to God. And we ought to, you ought to try to make sure that we're, we're doing what's right in God's eyes, not just in man's eyes. And God's going to see our heart and know what we're trying to do. And he's going to see our outward appearances as well. So let's flip back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, just having gone over that. Because a lot of people like to just say, Again, you know, that, that they don't like, oh, I don't like all the teaching on rules and all this other stuff. Well, look, first of all, this is a New Testament teaching. This is not even in the Old Testament. It's not, I'm not saying, you know, that we should just throw out the Old Testament. Some people teach that. We don't believe that here. There's a few things that have been changed in the New Testament. But no, this is coming straight from the New Testament in the, Paul's epistle to the Corinthians where he's explaining here, um, look down at verse... Well, and, and see, there's all oftentimes with with God's rules and His commandments, there are great. There's a picture of a greater truth to be learned here, right? Um, and in this case, it's talking about it's basically a picture of authority in our head. So, um, look at verse number two. We'll reread some of this. He says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. So the head, who is our authority? The head of every man is Jesus Christ. He's in charge. He's the boss. Jesus Christ is the one that is our head. So when we look for, to anyone for anything, we look to God. We look to Jesus Christ. But then he goes on, he says, and the head of the woman is the man. So when, when you're married, um, when you have that relationship, the husband and wife, the, the man is the head of the household. That is what God has ordained. God has put the man in that, in that place of authority. And, you know, again, today that flies in the face of what a lot of people like to think or believe, but that's the way he made it. That's the way he designed it, and that's what Scripture tells us. And you can't argue with this verse. I mean, it says the head of the woman is the man, just as the head of man is Christ. And then it says, and the head of Christ is God. God's at the top of all things, right? And then verse 4, it says, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. So now we're going to see two uses of the word head there, right? And this is where it might get a little bit confusing, but it shouldn't be too bad. First, he's saying any man um, praying or prophesying, having his head covered, talking about his physical head, dishonors his head. So who does it dishonor? It dishonors Christ. So he's saying if a man has his head covered, that dishonors Christ. And we're going to see a little bit later what he means by covered. See, a lot of people today think that think this means like covered like with a hat. And maybe you've seen there's some religions that, that the women will wear these like bonnets on their head. And like they kind of look a little funny. They'll be, they'll be wearing these dresses like little house on the prairie and they have these big bonnets on their head. And, and it, looks, it looks a little bit funny today. But one of the reasons they do that is because they... They misunderstand this verse. They misunderstand what this is teaching here with, the, with just the word covering. We're going to see, I'm going I'm to show it to you and I'll point it out that the word covering all throughout this chapter when it's being referred to is just your hair. And the Bible explicitly says that. But we'll keep reading here a little bit and I'll point that out in just a second. The Bible says in verse 5, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. And who is her head? Her head is the man. It says, For that is even all one as if she were shaven. So the man is not supposed to have his head covered. The woman, the woman is supposed to have her head covered. And even here, I mean, we already are starting to see right off the bat that he's comparing a woman's head not being covered as being shaven. I mean, if that was just talking about a hat, why would it even bring up having your head shaved? Right? But this is talking about her head being shaven. Verse number 6 it says, For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. Again, another verse referring to being shorn or shaven. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. So he's saying, look, the man is, man is made in the image of God. 
That is how man created, that is how God created man in his own image. And he's saying, you are in God's image. Your head should not be covered because God's head is not. And he's saying, you're going to bring dishonor unto God, basically, when you cover your head. And he says, the woman is the glory of the man. So it's a dishonor for, for the man when his woman's hair is not covered. Um, just same way that if a man's head is covered, he dishonors God. Um, it says in verse 8, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. And again, I want to make this clear because we don't believe that, that a woman is less valuable than a man. And I've said this in previous sermons. We have different roles. We have different functions. God has created male and female amazingly different. I mean, different attributes, different, you know, women are, tend to be more emotional. Men tend to be a little bit, you know, level, just a different level thinking. I mean, there's just, there's all kinds of different things. Men are stronger physically. I mean, it's just a fact of nature that men are physically stronger than women. Women are the weaker vessel, the Bible says. There's differences. There are natural differences. Women are able to, to raise and nurture and, and, and nurse children. Men can't do that the same way. We don't have the same abilities. God has created women to be mothers and moms and, and to raise our children that way and men to be fathers. And it doesn't make one any better or any worse than the other. It's like we have a washing machine and a drying machine. They do two different things. One cleans the clothes and washes them. The other one dries them. But it doesn't make one any better than the other one. They have, they have that same value. So when we look at God's word, you know, people today will try to make you think that you're less valuable as a woman because you're taking on a godly role. Because today's world will try to tell you, oh, well, you're not worth that much unless you could go out and get a job, unless you could do all this other stuff that your husband's doing. But that's wrong. That's false thinking. God has designed us a specific way to do specific things. And, and he's even saying here that the man was not created for the woman, but the woman for the man. You remember when Adam and Eve were first created in the Garden of Eden? God created man first, and he set him in the garden. He says, it's not good for man to be alone, but I will create a, a help that is meat for him, a help for Adam. The woman was created to be Adam's helper and companion and everything else. And again, it doesn't make her, her role like less valuable, but that's just what her role is. And, and we ought to be trying to live our lives in God's will and in God's roles. And what he's explaining here, he's kind of going through this because this idea of, our, of honoring our head has to do with an authority. Okay, first of all, God is our authority. God is the head of every man. God is the supreme authority. And he's saying if we cover our head, we're dishonoring him. And the same way, the husband is the head of the household. He's the head of his wife. When a woman doesn't have her, when a woman does not have her head covered, she's dishonoring her husband, which is her head. Let's keep reading here. It says in verse 11, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. And this is where he's just explaining, look, in Christ, there is neither male nor female. So that's where we get, you know, I mean, the value is equal. God doesn't care about whether you're a man or a woman in the sense of, does he love one more than the other? No, I mean, he loves us all equally. The same way a father loves his sons and his daughters, I mean, you should love them the same. They're, they're all your children. It doesn't matter. He said, in the Lord, it doesn't matter. But in our roles, in our, in our lives, in our daily life, there are specific roles that we need to, to, to play out. Verse number 12 says, For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? So now, up to this point, we've just been seeing these references of being covered, being not covered, being covered, being not covered, with a few references of being shaven and shorn. But now we're going to get into, I mean, he's just going to lay it out and explain exactly what is the covering referring to. Is it talking about a hat? Let's keep reading. Look at what it says in verse number 14. It says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. Look at this. For her hair is given her for a covering. So right there, it flat out just says, look, her hair is given her for a covering. So when we see um, it's saying it's a shame, doesn't even, he's saying 
even just naturally, without even having to look at the Bible, he says, isn't it just nature itself just tell you that it's a shame for a man to be walking around with long hair? He's like, can't you even get that just from nature, just from the natural things? You know, I mean, women look a certain way and men look a certain way. And it's natural for women to have long hair. And you look at someone, if you look at someone from behind and you just see someone walking down the street and all you can see is that they just have this really long hair, your first thought is going to be like, that's a woman. I mean, that's anybody, any normal person is going to think, that's a woman. And the flip side, if you just see someone walking down the street and all you can see is like, like the back of my head, you see this short hair, you're going to think, that's a man. Why wouldn't you? I mean, these days we got everything backwards, though. I mean, now it's like you can't even tell. Is that a woman? Is that a man? Sometimes you could be facing forward. You don't even know if it's a woman or a man. And that's a, I'll tell you what, that's a shame. It truly is a shame. God created us different. He wants us to be different. He doesn't want to have this unisex, unigender person. He wants women to be women. He wants men to be men and to look like such. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. Now, thankfully, you know, we, no one... Look, this is not a problem that we have in our church. And again, this is probably what a more of a minor thing. However, God de devotes half of a chapter of the Bible to this subject, which is why I'm even going over it. Because it's important to kind of understand some of these doctrines. It's important to know that, um, that you know, the certain things are a sin. And this is something that, we could, that should be easily taken care of by people anyways. I mean, you should be able to just look at this. And I knew a guy too once that that had long hair. He got saved. He started going to church. He heard, he, he had seen this passage or he heard it preached. Next thing you know, the guy's got a haircut. No big deal, right? A lot of people just don't even know. Once you hear about it, once you see it, that should settle. It should be like, okay, well, that's what the Bible says and that's what I'm going to do. But, um, I wanted to hit this first. Now, if you think about this, you know, this, this chapter is more than just your physical hair because it's talking about honoring your head, right? And, and it keeps on bringing up God being our head and, and the authority structure. Now, it's no surprise at all. I don't believe it's any coincidence. You think about, think about rock music these days, right? Rock and roll going all the way back to the you know, 50s, 60s or whatever, even early time. Rock and roll has always been the music of rebellion. Has it not? I mean, you think about young teenagers. They're rebelling against authority, rebelling against their parents, rebelling against everything. It's all brought up through rock music. And what are rock musicians famous for? The men? Having that long hair, right? I mean, don't they all? They're playing their guitars and they're, you know, they've got this long hair flowing. It's, it's, a, it's a symbol of rebellion. They're dishonoring their head. Now, I mean, our hair, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Like, I don't care what kind of hairstyle I have. It really doesn't mean much of anything to me. I just want to do it, you know, it's just like, God said to keep it short, so I just shave it down short. Now, um, I'm not going to get into, like, every last little detail. Say, well, is this right? Is this right? Because it doesn't matter. It's, you, you know, if you're a man, you should have short hair. If you're a woman, you have long hair. Um, but likewise, you know, I wanted to hit this point real quick because I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. You think about the rock and roll music promotes rebellion against all kinds of godly authority. Now, I'm not, I don't care about rebellion against authority that, that is not of God. Like people just trying to exert authority over you even though they don't really have that authority. Like the government these days are trying to creep into every single last bit of your life and they really don't have that authority given to them from God to tell you what you can eat and what you can wear and all this other stuff. Look, that is not their job. So if you rebel against that authority, I don't have a problem with that. But when you start rebelling, like children rebelling against their parents, God has put the parents in charge of that household and in charge of those children. That is ungodly for children to be rebelling against their parents. Yet, I think of a lot of songs that I used to, to listen to growing up that teach kids basically just don't listen to your parents, rebel against your parents. And again, it's coming from people that have long hair because they just have this natural, it's coming, their rebellion against God is coming out in their outward appearance. See, they need to cleanse first that which is inside and then go get a haircut. But you can see what's evidence inside their heart by what's outside on their body. And at the same time, you know, you also find that the majority of women that are disrespectful towards their husbands and that they don't, you know, they're real bossy and everything else, they always tend to have these really short haircuts. And 
you might think, you know, you might not have ever thought about that before, but you start thinking about it, it's true. And a lot of that has to do, it's, it's a symptom, it's an outward symptom of their heart. It's an outward symptom of that rebellious nature of dishonoring their head because the woman's head is their, is their husband. That is who God ordained. That's who they're disrespecting and that's who they're being rebellious against the same way that men, they're being rebellious against God when they're walking around with their long hair. And that, again, it's, it's, it's something that's, that's an outward manifestation of what's inside their heart already in the vast majority of cases that people have a rebellious heart and it's just shown on the outside in their hair. Now, um, we ought to be respectful to all of God's given authorities in our life um, no matter what that be. And this is such an easy thing to follow. Like, It's kind of funny because people will get the most upset over sermons like this when it's such an easy thing to deal with. Um, we were kind of talking about this out soul winning today. You know, we, we preach and we believe that, that, again, men should be like men and women should be like women, which means we believe that women should dress like women and men should dress like men. Women should wear skirts and dresses. It's not for men to wear skirts and dresses, right? Men go out and they wear pants and they go out to work and they do these things. You know, it, it's, it's, it's God's given roles for us, yet these are the things that get people the most irritated. And it's kind of uncanny because... <laughs> with certain family members and friends, we've experienced a really hard time over some of these issues. And you think, what does that even have to do with them anyways? You know, we're, out, we're not out like telling all of our family and all of our friends saying, you need to do this and you need to dress this way. We don't do that. Look, if you want to hear the Bible about, about this stuff, come to church and you can hear it. And if you want to talk about it, we'd love to talk about it. But we're not out there just, just cramming it down your throat yet they still don't like to even see the fact or just know that, yeah, well, if you're going to buy clothing for my girls, they're going to wear dresses and skirts. I mean, that's what they wear. They're little girls. Or, or my wife the same way. And they, you know, it's something that just kind of just sticks in them. And I don't even know why. It's like, it's, who cares? If that's how we want to do it, what's the big deal? Yet people get so offended in these little things. And it's such a little thing. Like, what's the big deal? I mean, women have been wearing dresses for thousands of years. <laughs> Who cares if that's how we, you know, if that's how we decide to raise our children? I don't understand it. And it's the same thing with your hair. It's like, look, is it really that big of a deal to you, man, that has some long hair that you've been growing for 10 years to just get it cut off? I mean, is it really going to impact your life so tremendously to have this hair just cut off? I mean, look, Samson was a one-time thing, all right? Don't tell me that you're getting all of your strength from your hair. You can chop it off and you'll be just fine. And the same thing with women. I mean, is it really that big of a deal just to let it grow out? I mean, if God is already saying here, it's a glory for you to have long hair, that this will honor your head, that you're doing right by doing this, just let it grow long. It's, it's, it's really such a minor thing. And, you know, it's not something that we should even need to focus on very much in our lives. It's something, hey, if you're a man, get the haircut, you're done. You don't have to think about that ever again. There's one thing you just got checked off your list of getting right with God. That's one of the easiest things you can do. There's so many other things that are way harder. Hey, man, when we come across these easy things, let's just get that taken care of and get that out of the way so we can focus more on, on the things that do matter more and the things that, that are more important. See, this is a sermon that, that and again, I mean, this is, nobody in the service has this problem tonight, but it, we should still understand um, what we're learning about this and, and just what the Bible teaches about this. You know, the Bible tells us that even nature itself tells us that if a man has long hair, it's a shame unto him. And which tells me that it's unnatural for a man to have long hair. It's naturally a shame. People should be, a man should be embarrassed if you have long hair. There's only a few places where the Bible mentions like natural things or, or being um, things of nature that you can just tell from nature. Um, there's only a few places the Bible mentions that. And one of the places is in Romans chapter 1. And I would not want to be anywhere near associated with what this mentions in Romans chapter 1. If I were a man saying, you know, the Bible saying that nature teaches you that it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Look at what the, what the Bible also refers to as far as things just being natural. In Romans 1.26, I'll just read this for you. The Bible says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, 
For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. The Bible's talking about homosexuals, I'm talking about queers, just being completely against nature. And it is. And don't let don't be deceived by this by this this homosexual community trying to tell you that, oh no, this is how I was born and this has always been me. That's the way God made me. No, it's not. This is a choice that people make. It's going against nature. That desire for a man to be with another man, that is against nature. That is not the way that God designed you. Woman be women being with other women, that is not the way that God designed you. He designed you with natural instincts. To, to, to be with the opposite gender. And that's why it's revolting and disgusting to even read some of these verses, to even think about that, to think about men with men burning their lust toward one towards another. It's disgusting, and it ought to turn your stomach to even think about that. Yet today, society is trying to tell you that everything is just fine. Hey, no, this is normal. Hey, no, you need to accept this. No, we don't. The Bible says that they need to be put to death. The Bible puts the death penalty on homosexuality. Yeah, you heard me right. The death penalty. The Bible says they should be stoned with stones. The same thing with adultery. The same thing with kidnapping. The same thing with murder. All of these sins, the Bible says, no, they should be put to death. But we have a really relaxed system of, ju of justice today that isn't doing justice. It's doing injustice by taking these pedophiles, these perverts, and just turning them back out on the street after a few years and saying, oh, well, you have to register where you live. Yeah, because that's going to stop them from defiling some more children. They need to be put down like a, dir like a dirty dog, like a, like a bad dog that just needs to be put down. These, these stinking perverts and pedophiles that go out and defile children and ruin their lives for the rest of their lives because of their perversion in their head. They're sick and they're twisted. And that's what the Bible teaches. But anyways, I'm going to get off that subject. So <laughs> all I was trying to remember, like, how did I even get on that tangent? It's because of, of being against nature. It's, like, it's not natural for men to have long hair, just like it's not natural for men to want to be with men. I would not want to be anywhere close to being lumped in to that group together. And um, let's see, I already mentioned that. Last thing, it's a real short sermon tonight because this is, this is pretty a simple, this is a really simple topic um, <clears throat> to preach on. But, you know, even though now the length of your hair, turn if you would to Luke chapter 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke in the New Testament. Luke chapter 16. The length of your hair, it may not be the worst sin in the world. Okay? This isn't the biggest sin that you could commit. However, it still is a sin. And the Bible does dedicate half a chapter to something. If the Bible didn't talk about it, I wouldn't talk about it. But it's written right here. It's in plain English. It's showing us, hey, look, God does care about this thing. As I mentioned in the beginning of the sermon, if God didn't care, it wouldn't be here. Amen. But he does, he does care about it. It is here. And I'm going to preach about it because it's the truth and it's what it says. And, you know, this is the type of sermon, you know, I'm glad that there's no one here just to get offended because I, I, I mean I don't I would never want, when I preach any sermon and 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 take this to heart too remember this for for future sermons when you come back if I hit on something that maybe you're guilty of maybe there was a man sitting in here that had really long hair right maybe we just had a visitor tonight. I'm not going to change what I'm preaching on this subject because he walks in. Now, I don't want this person to get offended. But if he gets offended, it's not me. It's God's truth that's going to offend him. I want him to, to, to get right with God. I would want him to, to be able to humble himself and to be able to accept and hear and say, you know what, this is what the Bible says instead of, instead of being rebellious. Now, anytime we come across things and... This might be easy for all of us to receive because it's like, well, we're all doing fine on this subject. But there's going to come a point where you're going to hear something that you are doing and that you are guilty of. And I'll tell you right now, it's not me like trying to pick on you. Okay, don't think that like Pastor Burson's got it out for me, man. He was just laying on me. Because most of the time, I don't even know. Most of the things that we preach about have a lot more to do with the heart than have to do with the outward appearance. Now, like I said, if, if someone were to come in here, I'm not going to just change my sermon completely because I'm worried about offending them. No, actually, 
If that were to happen, I'd think, well, God made this happen because apparently that's what he needs to hear. The whole goal of, of preaching on his sin isn't to disparage you. It's not to bring you down. It's not to say, oh, you're so wicked and you're so bad and, and you ought to be ashamed and, and that's it. No, the goal is to, is to help you to change so you could realize this and say, no, actually, this is important. Right? And that's, and that's kind of why sometimes I get worked up and I might yell about things. It's because it is important. You know, God put it in his word. We need to understand this. But it's not just to bring you down. It's to help you to, say, to understand and get to the point to realize, okay, yeah, this is the truth. And I'll just accept that truth and, and make the changes necessary. We all need to make changes in our lives. We're all sinners. None of us is perfect. So we need to be able to, to identify the sins in our lives. Now, if I had a sin and I didn't even know it was a sin... I would really hope that someone would come and tell me and say, hey, you know what, brother? What you're doing isn't right. God's not pleased with you. God's not happy with that. Let me show you from Scripture why. And if we have the right heart, we'll have that same type of an attitude so that we can serve God properly. It's kind of like, you know, if you're walking around and you got a bunch of food smeared on your face, you know, and you don't know about it, wouldn't you rather just have the first person you see just be like, hey, you got something right here. You, need, you want to clean that up. Instead of walking around like the entire day and like you're talking to your boss and you're talking to these other people and you have all this stuff just messed up on your face. Like that would be embarrassing. You'd hope that someone would tell you in advance. And that's kind of a silly example. But if you think about, you know, our sins with God, God is not pleased with us when we're living in sin. God does not want us, you know, we're not going to be blessed. He's not going to be happy with us. So I would hope that someone would be able to say, if, especially if I'm ignorant of it, I don't know that this is a sin. I mean, if someone were to hear this and say, well, I didn't even know that that was a sin. Well, now you know. And now you can do something about it to get right with God. And that is the whole purpose of all of, of the vast majority of the sermons that I preach. And so that, hey, maybe you didn't know this was a sin before. Maybe you didn't realize how God feels about this. But this is how he feels about it. And it's up to you then to take that and do with it what you will. You know, it's up to you to have the, the type of heart that's receptive to the message to be able to say, okay, you know what? I can see what, what Pastor Berzer was saying. I can see that in the Bible. I can see that makes sense. Now, if I say something and it's contradicting the Bible, don't listen to me. I'll say that first. Hey, if you can see something here and the Bible saying, you know what? No, this is the Bible saying something different. Go with the Bible. And that's why it's so important for you to read on your own, for you to read the Bible. Take it home. Read every day because you don't want to be deceived by somebody. You don't want someone to be able to just, to just tell you, oh, no, the Bible says this, the Bible says that, the Bible says that. Well, if you don't know what the Bible says, anyone can say anything to you and you just won't know. You need to know for yourself. You need to read this book because this is the truth. It's not what any one man says. It's what's in the pages of God's word. So, so I urge you to, to know it for yourself. But that's also why I'm going to turn to a lot of scripture to prove what I'm saying. And hopefully I can do that in, in, with everything that I preach that you can see the scripture behind what I'm teaching and what we believe. Because it's coming from God's word. It's, I'm, I'm really try hard not to just preach my own opinion. Now, in Luke chapter 16, this is the last point I'm going to make. Look at verse number 10. And we're going, to, this is, this, we're going to apply this verse to what we're preaching about tonight. Luke 16, verse 10, it says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, mammon just means money, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? There's a great truth to be learned here. He's saying, look, if you just have like the little things, like taking care of your own money, like if, if you can't even handle that, then who's going to give you like really great riches to take care of, right? If you've proven yourself unworthy to even fix the smallest things, to even take care of or be responsible for the little things, why is anybody going to entrust you to do something bigger, to be something greater? What we're preaching about tonight, I mean, the length of your hair, that is, that is a little thing. That is so easy to fix. I bet you're, I mean, that's just something you just go snip, 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 or not snip, snip, <laughs> one way or the other, right? It's an easy fix. 
And but if God sees you and you just be like, no, I don't want to. I don't want to cut my hair, or no, I I want to let my hair grow. Whatever it is, God's gonna see that and be like, okay, that's a little thing. That's a minor thing. If if you can't even just just get that right, why am I gonna you know bless you more or do or, you know or, or or expect you to do anything more? And in this in this passage, it's referring to to riches, right? I mean. The Bible says that we're earning treasures for ourselves in heaven. When we do right by God, when we, when we walk according to His word, when we do what's right, when we clean up our life, when we win souls, when we, when we do all these different things, we're earning treasures for ourselves in heaven. If we can't even do, if we can't be faithful in that which is least, as it says in verse number 10, we're not going to be faithful in that which is much. If we can't even handle the little things, we are not going to be good in that which is, which is much. And it says, he that is unjust in the little things, if you're, if you're not right with God, hey, you're, you're definitely not going to be right with the big things. So let's, uh, as, you, as you hear the little things in the Bible, hey man, just get those taken care of right away. God will see that and he'll see your heart and be like, okay, well, here's someone who wants to serve me. He'll help you get through the bigger problems when he sees that you're taking care of all these, these, these more small things. And not to just completely dismiss you know, this teaching of your hair as just, oh, well, I could just ignore it because it's a small thing. No, it, it's still, I mean, it's a sin is still important. I mean, it's still something you don't want to mess with, okay? It's not, we shouldn't just be flippant about it and just say, oh, well, it doesn't even matter because it does. It doesn't matter as much as a lot of other things, but it still has some kind of importance here. Don't just be flippant about it. Take care of the little things and God will help you to get through the big things. And why even focus on, I mean, there's, so, there's enough big things in our lives that we need to take care of we shouldn't be distracted with these little things. Just get those things taken care of and out of the way. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for, um, for the Bible, for the truth that you've given to us, dear God. I pray that you would please just help us to, to understand more about you, um, more about the, the way that you'd have us to live our lives. God, we thank you so much for your, your extreme mercy and, and long-suffering with us and that you, you help us to grow um, after we get saved, dear Lord, we just start off as newborn babes, that we desire the sincere milk of the word, that we just desire to, to hear more of the truth, dear God. Help us all to continue to grow. Feed us, dear Lord, from your word. Help us to know the Bible. Help us to, to make the time that's necessary to read on our own so that we wouldn't be deceived by other people and, and other people's teachings, dear Lord, but that we could know exactly what you would have for us to know in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.